Welcome to our new study in the book of Revelation. Revelation speaks to our world today. Everyone knows our world is rapidly changing. Come and see how God already knew about it. You will discover it's easier to understand than you thought. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember you on you. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I try my best, but it's just never good enough. I'm reminded of how much I need to know. You are for me, you're not against me. You are with me. I'm not alone through all the darkest times and brightest days. I know. So glad that you're back with us again. We are going to have a journey in Revelation chapter 12 today, and uh, it's going to take us a couple of presentations to get through it. One of my favorite chapters, some of the most visual pictures that just speak volumes about what God is all about and what his church is all about. So I hope you just hang on and enjoy it. Um, understand that God thinks of church bigger than you think and I think. Uh, he has his people all over the planet in every church. So just kind of keep that picture in mind or that thought. And I want to take a, to you to our uh, wonderful picture on the western United States. If you've never been to Leavenworth, Washington, uh, someday if you get the opportunity to come into Leavenworth from the south side and you go through town, it's this beautiful barbarian village. Take the Icicle Creek Road and just drive up that road for 10 minutes. And that's, that is what you're going to see, those granite spires and cliffs. Uh, some of the finest rock climbing in the northwest is just right there in Icicle Creek, as well as on Highway 2 headed up over the pass. Uh, you meet a lot of rock climbers in there. So hope you enjoy that picture. Thank you, Sherry, so much for blessing us with it. Now we need to jump into Revelation 12. This is going to be an action-packed presentation. Revelation 12, the thoughts of God, look, there is a great, great sign. So God has a plan. Revelation is God's presentation of that plan. Revelation 12 begins the final events that unfold right down to the end of time. So first, we get a historical overview of how it begins. But I want you to think of the story as having the ability to move you in time as if it were fluid, like you could just run back and forth in a pool and go from Genesis to the end of time, back to the birth of Christ, back to the end of time. Time to God is different than it is to you and I. So when he unfolds chapter 12, you need to be ready to move back and forth in time in the story. So it begins in verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven. Now the emphasis is, look, this is incredible. A great sign means you're supposed to stop and look and see this incredible sign. It says there is a woman. Now this, first, this is the first woman introduced in Revelation. She is symbolic of the church, the bride of Christ. Now, this is the untainted or pure church reflecting the righteousness of Christ. There is another woman we will meet later. She is very different. But for right now, we wanted to stay with the woman in verse 1. She was clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So, the sun is the glory of God's righteousness. The moon always reflects the light of the sun, or always, in this case, would reflect the glory of the Father in Christ. The crown is the word stephanos, which was, a, in Greek, a crown for the Olympic champion, the crown of victory. The 12 stars is the number of God's church. There's 12 tribes, 12 loaves, 12 disciples, 12 gates, 12 foundations for the holy city. 12 always represents those things that belong to God. So those 12 stars are significant. 
and and they represent the church. So here you have this woman given to John as he tries to describe her, and look how much it tells you and I. Isn't that amazing? It says in verse 2, she was with child, she cried out, being in labor, and in pain to give birth. Now that word for cried out is the word that's used of the martyrs crying out under the altar that we talked about earlier. Not the word used for a woman giving birth. So this is more than just the child's birth. This speaks to something about the church itself and her experience as well as the birth of Christ. It says she was with child and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. So if this is the birth of Christ, it would bring the birth about of his new church because Christ is the head of the church and that church is going to suffer persecution as Christ did. And that would have the cry of the martyrs in it as well. The cause of the persecution, the suffering, and the wars declared on the church are going to be represented in the next character introduced in chapter 12. So, we have met the woman, the church. Now we're going to meet the source of the grief and the pain. It says in verse 3, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, or seven crowns. It says, and his tail swept away about a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. So here we are now. We, we have this war in heaven and now we are suddenly with the dragon waiting to destroy this child that's about to be born. And what did God do for the child that was about to be born just prior to its birth? Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt when King Herod ordered the murder of all baby boys ages two and under. So here we see in Revelation 12 the attempted murder, the plot, but you can see how God intervened and saved Christ. Notice verse 5. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Now I'm going to pause right here for something really important to you. When we talk about a leader, that rod of iron also speaks more to what a shepherd would be using. Now the rod of iron was not used to beat the sheep. Some people think this rod of iron is steel and strong and used as absolute power but the rod of iron normally had a ball on the end of it. And its purpose was to direct the sheep, to guide them, not to beat them, not to be used as a weapon. In fact, a shepherd who abused any of its sheep would be considered a criminal. So to rule the nations with a rod of iron means that he's going to rule them in the sense that he will guide and direct them. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So you realize what we, we just went to the Mary and Joseph in Egypt to now his ascension into the heavenly presence of God and his throne. You see, this is what I'm talking about, how time is fluid here in chapter 12. And that all happened just in a few words. Verse 6, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that she would be nourished for 1,260 days. So, listen carefully. Wilderness is a vast open space with little population. When the church was under its most severe persecution in Europe, you had this group of Baptists and Anabaptists and those who wanted religious freedom all got on boats and they went to an open, vast wilderness called the New World, which would eventually become America. And there the church would flourish for 1,260 days, or in prophetic time, 1,260 years. So God now 
has moved us in time to his living church established after the ascension of Christ to the shelter provided for the church to flourish in what we would call today the wilderness or matching perfectly North America when they came where there was little or no population. Now, prophetic time is not as complicated as we make it. Daniel and Revelation share the same prophetic time prophecy. It's referred to as a time times and a half a times, 42 months or 1,260 days. Now pay attention. Daniel 7.25, time times and a half a time. Revelation 11.2, 42 months. Revelation 11.3, 1260 days. Revelation 12.6 for 1260 days. All of those four areas are time markers, but they're all exactly the same amount of time. But most importantly, notice that Daniel 7.25 has a direct connection to Revelation 11 and 12. Now, God found a place for his young church to flourish. He has always watched over his people. He has always provided the church the same way he provides for you. Now, in Revelation 12, 7 to 12, we're going to enter into a very short interlude. Remember what an interlude is. It's where God says, okay, I'm going to give you the rest of the story. I'm going to give you this important information. This section provides further information of why the dragon is angry with the woman. Here we go, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Now we just went back in time. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. Now, I want you to pay attention to Daniel 10, 13, and 14. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. This is the angel talking to Daniel. But then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Notice Daniel 10, 21. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth, yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against those forces except Michael, your prince. Revelation 12, 7, there was war in heaven and Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. So in Daniel 12, 1, now at that time, Michael, the great prince, stands guard over the sons of your people. He will arise. The word Michael simply means son of the king. So here you notice the language, the great prince. And then in Jude 9 and 10, you have, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said to him, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael, who means the great prince, also in Hebrew means who is like God. So the text also says, the great prince. A prince is the son of the king. Jesus is the son of the king of the universe. So I just wanted to lay that out for you. It's a very important aspect of the story connecting us directly to Jesus. So notice in 7 of Revelation 12, the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong, strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown with him. Can you think of another place where the serpent appears? Oh, yeah, Genesis. Right there, yeah, Genesis and that conversation with Eve and the serpent, who is the source of rebellion in heaven and caused the war in heaven. So what do you think the serpent is up to here? Now he's cast down to this earth and all of the angels in the rebellion, which today we would call evil angels, now are cast down to this earth. So if people tell you there's no such thing as evil spirits, this story in Revelation 12 is confirmation that yes, they do exist. Notice Revelation 12 verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now 
the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. Now, hang on, because this is going to get really interesting. So please pay attention. There was war in heaven. The great serpent who shows up in Eden, who deceives the whole world, starting with Eve, are cast down to this earth after the creation of this earth. But when you go to the book of Job, guess who shows up in the presence of God to make accusations against Job? None other than Satan himself, Lucifer, who's the accuser of the brethren. God, you're not being fair. You're, you're giving Job an advantage. You just let me have Adam and he will reject you. But now we come to Revelation 12.10. And Lucifer is cast down and defeated and no longer is able to access the throne room of heaven, something has happened to utterly and completely defeat Lucifer. And I'm going to tell you that when Christ took the sins of the entire human race, from Eve all the way down to the last man standing, last woman, child, on this earth standing, that he has paid in full the penalty for their sin, Satan became a defeated being the day Christ rose from the tomb and defeated sin and eternal death. Did you catch that? That's why Revelation 12 is so exciting because Lucifer is a defeated being. He has no longer access to make accusations against you. Wow. Doesn't that mean that you don't have permission to make accusations against yourself? Thought I'd just toss that in. You see, it was at Calvary that Christ utterly, utterly defeated Satan. He still had access to the throne room of God in the book of Job. Now he no longer has access to God's throne to accuse you as unworthy to be saved. That means you don't have permission to accuse yourself either. But notice verse 11. And they, that's you and me, and everybody on the planet, they overcame him, that's the serpent, that's the devil, because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even when faced with death. Hence the cry of the woman who was going to give birth, the cry of the martyrs. Revelation 12, 12. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell on or in them. This is an opportunity for you to praise and have joy unlimited because Christ has fully defeated Satan. The only power he can have in your life is the power you and I choose to give him. That's amazing, isn't it? Revelation 12 is so profoundly important. I mean, here is a call for you to rejoice. Heaven is going to join you. Everyone on earth is going to join you. We can rejoice in his defeat because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, in his resurrection, and in his ascension to be seated at the right hand of God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that just absolutely, absolutely amazing? Revelation 12, 12. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. So I want to pause here for just a moment. I want to challenge you to just process I mean, this is a profoundly significant verse. What God is telling John that John is writing down so that you and I can read this, he is telling us clearly without exception that the devil has a plan to prevent every human being he possibly can in his rage from accepting the gift 
of the righteousness of Christ, to accepting the gift of the atonement of Christ, to accept the gift of Christ's completed work in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that he has a plan to prevent every man, woman, and child from accepting that very, very precious gift. But didn't I just tell you you're on the winning side? That Lucifer's already been defeated. I want you to think of it in another way. Think of it this way. If, if I knocked on your door and I had a Super Bowl ring and a contract and I said to you, hey, would you like to join the winning Super Bowl team this coming year, next January. Here's a contract. I'm going to give you the ring of victory today, and this contract guarantees that you have already won the biggest game in the entire universe. Would you sign up and join the team? And I'm giving you the ring today. Would you join? Isn't it stunning that every man, woman, and child of the earth doesn't want to accept the gift that Christ has provided already? That this raging, angry Lucifer that is fully defeated, he's already lost the game. Christ has already won it, and he says, hey, won't you come be on my team? And Satan's saying, no, I need you to be on my team. And now you have that tension that is taking place between the two forces of good and evil. Which side? Which side do you prefer to be on? Isn't that the question? We have a choice to make. An important choice. Notice verse 13. When the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, almost sounds like he was surprised, doesn't it? He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now let's pause here for just a moment. He has nothing else to do except do one thing, and that is to go after the church that Jesus founded when he was on earth. Now that church has come through centuries, hasn't it? It's gone through so many changes. We had the corporate church. There was only one church in the beginning, kind of the universal church. And then we had that church split into the Protestant Reformation. And now we have, what, three, 4,000 different denominations? I wonder if we have all those denominations because Satan has the ability to create a rift between us. The angel saw when he was thrown down to the earth and he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Understand that Satan has declared war on the church, all of them. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time, times, and a half a time. That's exactly the language in Revelation 12 of the book of Daniel, a Jewish way of reckoning time. And the serpent poured water out like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with a flood. Now, when we get to Revelation 17, you're going to find what water represents symbolically. But I can tell you here that water represents people's multitudes. So if we look at this text and interpret it symbolically, it says, and the serpent poured people like a river after the woman so that he could cause her to be swept away. So if water in Revelation represents people, this passage can be interpreted that Satan, through the compromise of the truth of Christ, flooded the church with people who came out of popularity of the church to join it. And the alteration of the gospel that diminished the saving power of Jesus, and by teaching that you can add merit to your salvation through good actions and right behavior, be saved. Satan has created a distortion of Christianity to make it popular and cheap to degrade and sweep away 
and to destroy the church. Now, I didn't write that. That's right there in verse 15. That's on your screen. The serpent poured water out like a river out of his mouth after the woman to cause her to be swept away with the flood. By diminishing Christ, Lucifer declared war on the church. But the earth helped the woman, in verse 16 it reads, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Now Revelation 17 will enrich that story even more. But let's just take this apart for just a moment, okay? When the woman went into the wilderness, the earth opened up and saved the woman. And it took that onslaught in Europe that the church, with the diminished view of Christ, religious wars, all the things that happened, the earth moved from Europe then into that great vast wilderness called the New World, which became America. And there, God kept her growing and nurtured and victorious. So now who is Satan coming after? Those who keep the commandments of God. You know what the new covenant is? I'm going to write my laws on your heart and on your mind. And here's the faith of Jesus, the testimony. There it is. The righteousness of Christ brings you in harmony with the commandments of God. We'll see more of this when we get to Revelation 17. That's just such a magnificent, intense chapter, isn't it? Here the church is victorious. But what irritates Satan is when people love God with all of their heart, mind, and soul, and their neighbor is themselves. And they accept Jesus as their only hope of salvation. That is what defeats Satan. The story will unfold in a deeper, more vast way. I want to go to our closing picture. This beautiful little reservoir is just in the mountains of Utah, just up the road, not too far from Park City, maybe another 45, 50 minutes. You head on up into the mountains, and here's this beautiful reservoir. The rain was kind of coming and going that day. Just this lovely, beautiful place up this river. It just makes you want to just say, man, I could just love having a house just back there on that ridge, right in the center, looking down that lake. Wouldn't that be lovely? Sherry, thank you so much for the blessings you bring. Thank you for listening. Go back and read chapter 12 and enjoy it. It is awesome. Take care. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.